let God's people say amen. Greetings in the name and grace and peace of Jesus, our risen Christ. We come on this second Sunday of Lent uh, to hear again how it is that God's, God loves us, how it is that God's power liberates us, and how it is that we are then sent forth to offer liberation through God's great good news to all we meet. As we gather this morning, I would remind you that we are now in the middle of our virtual grace extravaganza. So we hope you've gotten onto the website. Uh, you have registered and been given a, a bid number and a way to bid. Know that those auction items will be up uh, all this week and you are welcome to be a, a part of that uh, action. I also would invite you to put on your calendars this next Friday, uh, at the, the uh, first Friday of March, and Kyle and I at seven o'clock that night will be uh, on uh, uh, virtually on your computers uh, or your TVs, however you view, uh, and we will be doing a, a stream of what extravaganza is, having a good time, showing some videos about the Center of Grace and the other things that uh, our mission money uh, helps to fund. So uh, please know that you're welcome to be a part of that celebration in a different way this year. I also would uh, remind you that for those of you who would like and so choose uh, as a part of perhaps a fasting dif- discipline this year, we're inviting you to skip a meal uh, one time a week or maybe do a day of skipped meals and gather that uh, collection together of what you might have spent and keep those throughout the course of Lent and then uh, offer that on Easter Sunday for our food ministries over at the Center of Grace. And that will be a way of uh, offering life to those who are most in need. Uh, as we uh, again gather this morning, uh, we will be looking at deliverance stories. Uh, again, just kind of a, a perspective out of uh, the book that our Lenten study uh, is around, Rachel Held Evans' book called Inspired. Hear these words. We don't tend to think of law as liberating, but for the people of Israel, these divine instructions helped forge a unique national identity, one wholly distinct from the cultures around them, including the Egyptian empire for, that for so long had oppressed them. It reminded them, too, that the God who parted the Red Sea and conquered Pharaoh's armies was sticking around for the long haul. This is not a God who liberates, then leaves. This is a God who walks with people through the desert in a cloud of smoke and fire and who literally sets up camp with them in the form of a traveling tabernacle. This is a God who cares about every detail of their new life together, right down to the management of their oxen. Deliverance, then, it seems, is not simply a one-time deal. And so as we come to worship this morning, we come inviting God's liberating presence to be among us as together we realize and recognize God's presence among us. Let us worship. Oh, 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 
This is a very, very, very special Sunday, most particularly for our third graders. And so third grade students, if you are watching and with us, I want you, if you don't have them already, to get out your brand new Bible. And friends, please know if you have a third grader and did not receive a Bible, it is not too late. We can get a Bible out to you or we can send one to you. Uh, But we love giving the word of God to our third graders. Now, third graders, these words are just for you. The Bible you hold in your hands this morning is the inspired word of God. Now, that word inspired is kind of a hard one. It, It literally means the breath of God or breathing or air. And so what it says to us is that God's presence was breathing in and through human beings, just like you and me, who wrote down the words that God inspired Uh, Receive your Bible and learn its stories and study its words. These stories belong to all of us and help us and help tell who we are. They tell us most especially that we belong to one another and that together we are the people of God. I hope that as you read your Bible, you will bring not only your faith, but your questions and your doubts. That's right. It's okay to question and and doubt what's written in this scripture because that's how we learn. And here at Grace, you can ask those questions and some of us longer-legged people will try to help you make your way through them even though we don't have all the answers either because God is God and we're not. We want you to find a loving, supporting, listening, and teaching community here at your church. And we commit to growing with you in faith and knowledge. Now, this is very important. I want you to hand your Bible to your parents. So parents, I want you to take your your third grader's Bible and I want you to hear this. We invite you to read these words with your child, to listen to their questions, to share your own ideas, and to be honest about your own doubts. Now all of you get to put your hands on the Bible. So I think it's big enough for all of you to get your hands at least on the Bible somewhere. Receive these Bibles with your hands, your hearts, and your minds. With the help of God's Spirit, read with curiosity. Listen with openness. And don't be afraid to ask questions with trust. We want you to grow with us in faith and knowledge with this Word of God throughout your entire life. Let's all pray together. Dear God, source of all wisdom, wonder, and truth, you have given these families as a gift to one another, and you have given each of us your living word of Scripture for the living of this life. Grant us wisdom, patience, and flexibility, courage to ask questions, and faith to live with the mystery of things we cannot answer. Remind us that this book is here to help us love and know God with all our hearts, minds, souls, and strength, and to better learn to love our neighbors as ourselves. In Jesus' name, amen. Third graders, congratulations for getting your Bible. And you know what? When we're back in in in-person worship, I'm going to have all of you come up and stand here up on this big area right with me, and we're going to bless you and your Bible again. And we can't wait for that time. But until then, I want you to crack this book open. Maybe even today, when the scripture is read, have your parents help you find it, and maybe you can follow along. Now I'll invite you to prepare for a time with Stacy. Hi everyone, can you believe it is the end of February? We are finishing up our month on kindness and talking about being a super fan. And it is so much fun to be a super fan, cheering people on, encouraging them, standing up for them. I got to be a super fan of our third graders this week and present them with their very own Bible. And it was so much fun. So if you're one of those students, grab your Bible, Turn to the back half, which is the New Testament. Look for the Gospel of Luke. Then look for the big number 10, that's the chapter number, and the small number 25, which is the verse. Now, while they're doing that, I have some things I want to show you. Can you tell me on my items on the table, what is alike and different about them? 
Well, you may not believe me, but these are all the top pizza toppings from the round the world. Yes, that is right. So in Sweden, they like to put banana and peanuts on their pizza with a curry sauce. In Brazil, they like to put green peas on their pizza, if you can believe that. I'm guessing you know what country has pepperoni as the number one topping. That would be us here in the United States. Now Russia likes to put a combination of sardines and tuna and mackerel and salmon. How does that sound for you? Costa Rica likes coconut. And in Japan, they like a combination of mayonnaise and potato. Anybody else eat their pizza like that? Now my favorite toppings are right here. I like potatoes, jalapeno, and, span and spinach. That's pretty fun singing all those world's favorite pizza toppings, right? I love how they're so different. In fact, I love how God made us all different too, and God loves each and every one of us. Now some of you might be asking yourself, I thought we were talking about kindness, so what does that have to do with different pizza toppings? And that is a fair question. Now as we get older, we start to see differences more, differences between us and others. And you know what? Sometimes those differences keep us from being kind. It's really easy to be kind to people we like and who are like us, but what about people who are different? So the question we need to ask ourselves is how do we show kindness to people who are different? And when we have big questions like that, where do we go? We go to the Bible. So my third graders with your Bibles, turn back to that book of Luke, chapter 10, and we're going to look at one of the most famous stories that Jesus told to answer this question. Now, a religious leader came up to Jesus to ask him a question, and he said, Teacher, what must I do to have eternal life? And Jesus asked him, What is written in the law? So the religious leader answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. Love God with all your strength and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as you love yourself. So Jesus told him he should do that. He should love God and love his neighbor. But the man wanted to make himself look good, so he asked Jesus another question to try to trick him. And he said, Who is my neighbor? And that's when Jesus told the story. A man was traveling down the road from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he got beat up by robbers. He got beat up really bad. He was almost dead. And as he lay there, a priest was walking down the road. But the priest crossed the road to the other side and walked without helping him. Then a Levite came by. A Levite was someone else who works in God's temple. He also walked by without helping. So everything seemed kind of hopeless. Well, then a Samaritan came by. Now to the people that Jesus was talking to, a Samaritan was considered to be an outcast. Very strange, very different. They would have seen them as an enemy. So would the Samaritan, the supposed enemy, help? Now, if a Jewish person was in trouble like this, a Samaritan would be the last person he'd expect to help. But listen to what the Samaritan did when he saw the man. When he saw the man, he felt sorry for him. He went to him, poured olive oil and wine on his wounds, and bandaged them. Then he put the hurt man on his own donkey and took him to an inn. The next day, the Samaritan gave two silver coins to the owner of the inn. He told the innkeeper that he would pay for any extra expenses when he returned. So when Jesus finished the story, he asked the religious leaders, which of the three do you think was a neighbor to the man who was attacked? The religious leader answered, the one who felt sorry for him. And Jesus told him, go and do as he did. So Jesus really surprised them with the ending. In fact, Jesus did that a lot. The priest and the Levite seemed like the people who should have helped, but it was the Samaritan who was different who actually stopped and helped. This story teaches us that we can show kindness to anyone, even someone, if not especially someone, who is different than this. You know, it's easy to, to be kind to people who are the same of us. It's a little bit harder to be kind to those who are different. So this week, I want you to focus on how can you be kind to people who are different than you. So next month, we are going to start with a new topic and a new theme. We are going to have new Kid Kits, so it's not too late to register if you want to get the March Kid Kit. And you know, 
I really do wonder what would a pizza taste like with all those toppings on it. Maybe you can try that out. We'll see you next week. Stacy reminds us how it is that living with kindness is part of how it is that we share the word of God with those around us. Now I'll invite you to prepare your hearts and minds for this prayer that we bring into God's embrace. As we move to prayer this morning, I would invite you to take a moment to quiet your minds, to center your hearts, and to breathe in the peace of Christ. If you would pray with me. Holy God, as we continue our Lenten journey, help us to be attentive to what we fill our minds, our times, our lives with. Help us to be attentive to what we hold on to and to what we need to let go. Challenge us as you did your first disciples about our loves, our priorities, our doubts, our fears, about what keeps us from faithfully following you. We are on this journey because we sense that you are somehow the way, the truth, and the life, and that without that way there is no going, without that truth there is no knowing, and without that life there is no living. So draw us once again to your side, you who are our only hope, our love, our strength, our refuge, our justice, our light our God, and our all. We know, O God, that you would gather us up as a hen gathers her brood under her wings. And so we are bold to cry out to you, we who are lost, confused, tired, anxious, frightened, mournful, and sick. We pray for ourselves, and we pray for our family, friends, and for congregants among us. We also pray for our world, which so often teeters on the edge of turmoil. We remember the people of Myanmar praying for restraint and nonviolence between the protesters and the military. We lift up the conflict in Ethiopia's Tigray region, a conflict which has resulted in human rights abuses and a refugee crisis and a lack of access to water, food, and health care. And we continue to pray for equitable access to health care and COVID-19 vaccines in our country and around the world. Be with those so adversely affected by the extreme temperatures of last week and with all who are now in the process of cleaning up. As we continue to walk with Jesus on the Lenten journey, attend to us, for we need your constant guidance. Teach us how to pray. Teach us patience. Teach us gentleness towards others and towards ourselves. And teach us how to receive your gentle grace. We pray this in the name of Jesus, who has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Hey, hey, hey.
when we turn our eyes toward Jesus, sometimes we wonder what is it uh, for which we are looking. Uh, what we know is that as we look into the heart of another, we see the face of Christ. Uh, sometimes that face is one of great need, uh, one of hunger, one of thirst, one who needs shelter. Sometimes that face is one who needs a listening ear. However it is that we can give of who we are and what we have, God can take those gifts, multiply them in abundance and offer them to those who are greatest need. We'll invite you to uh, take note of how the different ways there are to give on, uh, on the, uh, the site as you see it, as you worship this morning, and we would invite you to give generously. pray. Gracious God, indeed, like a shepherd, lead us. Lead us into lives of generosity. Lead us into hearts that are open with the expanding nature of your love that works through us. Lead us in understanding that as we give of what we have and who we are, you are able to bless your world in ways that we cannot even imagine. And so God, hear us as we humbly thank you for the opportunity we have to give. And bless us as we continue 
to live your life in this world. In Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. I invite you now to prepare your hearts, minds, and spirits for this reading from the scriptures. Our first scripture reading this morning is from Exodus. This is Exodus chapter 7, verses 14 through 6. And this is the introduction of the first plague in the conflict between the Lord and Pharaoh. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh's heart is hardened. He refuses to let the people go. Go to Pharaoh in the morning as he is going out to the water. Stand by the river bank to meet him and take in your hand the staff that was turned into a snake. Say to him, the Lord, the God of the Hebrews sent me to you to say, let my people go so that they may worship me in the wilderness. But until now, you have not listened. May God add blessing to the reading and the understanding of this scripture. You're invited to stand as you're able for the reading of the gospel. This is from Mark chapter 8, verses 34 and 35. This is part of Jesus' teaching during his ministry in Galilee. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God.
about to open uh, Pandora's box for all of you, I think. What's the hardest part of parenting? There may be as many different answers to that as there are sets of parents, but, but I want to focus on a, a theme that I think um, happens over and over again. I, I think that what one of the hardest things is for parents is letting go. You know, letting go when they're learning to walk. And, and they're ready to go and you think they're all wobbly, but, but you, have to, you have to pry their fingers from around your index finger and let them go, even if they might fall. Maybe, maybe the hardest part is letting them go when they go to school for the first time. And, and as they walk into that kindergarten room, it's as if you don't exist anymore. Maybe they've seen some of their fellow students in, in preschool. Maybe they know them from the neighborhood. And, and, and they're so excited. They've been waiting to go to school. Maybe they have older sisters and brothers who've been going to school. And they've been waiting to go to school and waiting to go to school. And now it's finally time. And it's as if you haven't spent the last four or five years seeing to their every need. Letting go is hard. Maybe it's letting them go out the driveway for the first time in the car by themselves to drive to school or to work and trusting that they'll get back home. Maybe, maybe it's moving them to college. Maybe it's letting them date. Uh, there, there's someone in our team here who's about to be the father of twin girls. And I think if I remember correctly, I heard him say not long ago that he wasn't going to let those girls date until they were 40. Maybe he'll go with them on every date they ever have because it's hard to let go. But you know what? Parenting isn't the only thing that's hard. What's the hardest thing about childing, right? Let's turn the tables a little bit. Maybe the, maybe the hardest thing about childing is when you stomp your feet and, and have a temper tantrum in the middle of an aisle in a discount store because you want a toy and your parent does not understand the life-changing importance it is that you have that toy. That's hard. Maybe, maybe the hardest thing about childing is when your parent says to you, you can't go. And you say, but all my friends are going. And your parent says, well, if all your friends jumped off of a, of a cliff, would you do so too? And you say, yes, and you mean it. And they don't get it. Maybe that's one of the hardest things about childing. Letting your parents be a parent is the hardest thing. Maybe the hardest thing is realizing that after you go off to college or you move out for the first time, it's like they wait maybe a day and then they start turning your room into a den or a workout place. Like you're never going to move home and live. You have to let go of that dream that they're always going to be there to save you and do your laundry and feed you. Although my guess is most of the time they do that if you go back home. Maybe... Maybe one of the hardest things about childing is letting your children, their grandchildren, stay with them the first time and giving them this encyclopedia of rules about what your child can eat and not eat, knowing as you walk out the door and leave them that their grandparents are going to give them cake even if you don't want them to. Sometimes the hardest thing about parenting and childing is letting go. Maybe that's one of the things that's the hardest about life. Letting go of a belief that life is always fair. Letting go of the, the belief that our dreams, every one of them, is going to come true exactly the way we want them to. Maybe it's letting go this understanding of God that we have, that God rewards the good and punishes the bad, and, and we can always tell the difference. Maybe it's letting go of that immature faith and allowing God to grow us in a way that sometimes is not easy. 
We're talking today about deliverance stories. We're, we're talking about letting go. In fact, we're talking about the story in the scriptures, which is about literally letting go. We all know the songs. When, when Israel was in Egypt land, let my people go. Oppressed so hard they could not stand. Let my people go. Go down, Moses. Tell old Pharaoh to let my people go. This Exodus grand story of God's power and and God hearing God's people enslaved and and God choosing to let them go. It, It seems like a dream realized, but not for Pharaoh. And so it seems pretty clear if we're going to look at who needs to to let go in this story, it's Pharaoh. But I'm going to tell you this morning and challenge you that Pharaoh isn't the only one. Moses also had some things to let go, and so did the people who were enslaved. Pharaoh had to let go of this idea that he was a god. To let go of this idea that, that he could say no to God and have it be okay. Pharaoh had to let go of this idea that he had about the political system and the economic system that he had set up exactly the way he wanted it that rewarded him and punished everyone else. He had to let that go. That's right there on the surface. It's easy for us to see. But what did Moses have to let go? His fear? His doubt, his anxiety, his insecurity. Moses, if you'll remember, was raised in Pharaoh's household, then finds out he's a Hebrew, then kills one of uh, the Pharaoh's uh, prison warders and and has to run for his life because he's committed murder and Pharaoh wants to do the same to him. And, And he finds his way into the hills and he falls in love and he gets married and he's working for his father in law, Jethro, and he's tending sheep. You know, maybe it wasn't the most important job in the world, but it also didn't put him in the crosshairs of, of, of wondering about his identity, of having to confront power. He was ready just to live his life and, and, and let everything else fend for itself, but, but God wouldn't let Moses go. <laughs> Moses had to let his idea of what his life was about to go. That one cuts a little closer to home, perhaps, for some of us. And what, what, what did the Hebrew slaves have to let go? I mean, they were ready. They were ready to be free. They were, they were ready to go out and be on their own. They, they were ready to not be treated in a way that kept them hungry all the time and, and where they worked for someone else and never saw any re- reward from that. But, but their idea of how God would do that, you see, would be to mount an army stronger than the Egyptian army and to simply supplant the Egyptians' oppression with them being in charge and maybe they would oppress their enemies who had kept them enslaved for over 400 years. And instead of a marauding army, they get Moses. Moses who tried to deny God's call five different times. Moses who heard that call out of a bush that was on fire that wasn't being consumed. What kind of a God is that? It's not like any of the Egyptian gods that Pharaoh and his people worshipped. Here comes Moses and and they say, why should we believe you? And and God has given Moses a staff and, and has said, when anybody disbelieves you, throw the staff down and it becomes a snake. And if you'll pick it up again, it'll become a staff. And so Moses does that for the people and Moses does that for Pharaoh and none of them are impressed. In fact, Pharaoh's own magicians do essentially the same thing. If God were going to choose a voice... To be the one to confront oppression. To bring God's deliverance. Why would God not at least pick someone who was articulate and eloquent and and was confident in what they had to say? And Moses tells God right up front, I'm none of those things. And God says, look, I'll send Aaron, your brother, with you. So not only is Moses not able to convince the people with these actions, he has to have a, a mouthpiece. The Hebrew people had to let go of their idea of what God's deliverance looked like. And when they get out into the wilderness, we know what they have to let go of. A desire to go back to what they'd always known. Maybe that cuts a little close to our hearts as well. We may convince ourselves that we don't want change. 
And if anything, this last year perhaps needs to convince us that we have to let that go. When Moses and Aaron go to Pharaoh, and we heard those scriptures this morning, and they say to Pharaoh, uh, the Lord our God, the God of Hebrews, says to you to let God's people go so that they can go out into the wilderness and they can worship. And it says that Pharaoh's heart was hardened. Now understand this, Pharaoh's heart will harden ten times. There are ten plagues before God's people are let go. And even then, Pharaoh will send his army after them when the Red Sea is parted. Because Pharaoh's heart isn't ready to let go of what it is that he understands himself to be as a leader, as a person of wealth, as an oppressive power. Are are we ready to let our hearts that may have grown hard over the years of our life, are we ready to let that hardness go? You know, ever since Ash Wednesday, have you noticed the theme we've been dealing with? God and Jesus are interested in our hearts. In that that Ash Wednesday service in the scripture from Matthew, Jesus says, it's not what you put into your mouth that defiles you, it's what comes out of your mouth that defiles you because what comes out of your mouth starts in your heart. This people worships me with their lips. And, and that is in vain, because their hearts are far from me. Last week with Noah and the ark, God comes and sees the wickedness of humanity and says and realizes that, that the thoughts of their hearts were only evil continuously. And their wickedness and violence grieved God to God's heart. Are you picking up with me on this? That what God is interested in in the Old and the New Testament are where our hearts are. And maybe there are some things in our hearts that we need to let go that that are making our hearts have a hardness that doesn't allow God to pour in God's spirit because we're not yet willing to let go that which is keeping us from receiving the love and the grace and the mercy that God has for us. It's really no different in the gospel. In in Mark's gospel, which these verses are smack dab in the middle of Mark's gospel, uh, these verses mark the turning point. And, And Jesus will go with his disciples from this place in Caesarea Philippi. He will go from this place on a on a journey toward Jerusalem for the last time. A resolute journey where he will not turn aside. And it's at Caesarea Philippi, this last place in Galilee, where Jesus asks the disciples who people say that he is. He's asking for a confession in Caesarea Philippi. By the way, if you look that up, Caesarea is the first name Caesar with an E-A on the end. It is the center of the worship of the emperor, Caesarea Philippi is, and it is the center of the worship of the Greek god Pan. Why would Jesus ask for a confession of faith in what could be called the most enemy territory that there is? The disciples had to let go the kind of Messiah Jesus was and is. Maybe we have a ways to go on that as well. When Jesus says, who do people say that I am? And they say, well, some say Moses and some say Elijah and some say John the Baptist come back to life. And Jesus says, uh, but who do you say that I am? And Peter answers correctly. He confesses Jesus as the Messiah. And then Jesus begins to tell them what's about to happen, that he's going to Jerusalem, that he will be crucified, dead, and that he will be resurrected. And Peter, and, and Peter says, no, Lord, because Peter has not let go of his vision of the Messiah as, as a victorious military leader that will overturn the Roman Empire no less than the Hebrew slaves felt like God would overturn the Egyptian Empire. And that what would supplant it would be them who had been oppressed for so long by those kingdoms, by those empires that were so filled with injustice. And yet that's not who God is in the Exodus and it's not who Jesus is facing his crucifixion. And Peter does not want to let go of of that picture of Jesus as a conquering hero who overturns the power of Rome. No, Lord, that can't happen to you. And Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. And then Jesus says the words that Sean read this morning. 
If any want, if any want to follow me, they must deny themselves, take up their cross and follow. For whoever wants to save their lives will lose them, and whoever is willing to lose their lives for my sake and the gospel will save them. And, and we, immediately, we, we immediately jump to what it means to, to, to do self-denial. And, and somewhere along the line, we decide that what, what God wants for us is only things that we want, but that evidently are bad for us. And so we have this battle within ourselves that what God wants for us isn't good. What we want for ourselves, we think is good. And God simply wants us to do without all those things that we think are good. Friends, that's wrongheaded. Not that I have any opinions, but that's wrongheaded. We think a good God of grace wants us not to have joy and happiness. Maybe we have some things we need to let go about our understanding of God. I wanted to read you this piece from theologian David Luz about these verses. We tend to think that life is something you go out and get or earn or buy or win. But it turns out that life is like love. It can't be won or earned or bought, only given away. And the more you give it away, the more you have. In fact, only when you love others do you most understand what love really is. Likewise, only when you give away your life for the sake of others do you discover your life. Tell me again, parents, what you learn, what you've learned about love by having children. Difficult children, messy children, rebellious children, independent children, children that you would give your life for. In fact, only when you love others do you most understand what love really is. Likewise, only when you give your life for the sake of others do you discover it. Somehow, in thinking about how to fulfill someone else's needs, your own deepest needs are often unexpectedly met. Call this the mystery of life, even the keys to the kingdom. We too, in, we too often tend to invest in a world of scarcity where there never seems to be enough. And the only thing we can count on are things that we own. Jesus challenges all of that by telling us that the only things we can hold on to are the things we are willing to give away. Love, Mercy, kindness, and compassion. So maybe the question is, on this second week of Lent, what is it that we need to let go? What is it that is keeping us bound from knowing the abundance of Christ? How is it like Pharaoh that we haven't yet let go of of power and of privilege, whether because of our, the color of our skin or our, or our gender? What is it that we've been unwilling to let go because we're afraid of losing that status and that position? Maybe like Pharaoh, God's calling on us to let go. What, what about Moses? Maybe, maybe like Moses, we need to let go of our fear of change, to, to let go of our, our fear of messing up what in our life seems to be Well, maybe not completely satisfying, but it's not completely dissatisfying. So why don't we just kind of stay the way things are? Maybe like the Hebrew slaves, we need to let go of our own idea of what it means to be free. Of how it is that we have decided God will come into our lives and and deliver us from whatever it is that we've decided we need to be delivered from. Maybe it's time to let God have the floor. Maybe like the disciples, we need to let go of a conquering Messiah and accept a servant Messiah who will wash the disciples' feet, who will not call down the wrath of God, even hanging on a cross, and who in fact will fulfill his promise of resurrection. Maybe we need to let go of putting God or Jesus in a box that we've defined and allow God to continue to move and expand and grow in us and in our world. So this is my challenge for this second week of Lent. 
Maybe what you need to let go is right up front and center and you know it without even having to give it a second thought. You know it's there and you just haven't been able to let it go. Or maybe what you need to let go is buried so very deeply that you don't want to see it. And to that I will ask you to pray for God to give you the courage to let what you need to let go rise to the top, to your awareness, to your consciousness. And and then I'm going to invite you to find a way to, to allow the power of God to help you let that go. Now let me give you some concrete possibilities. Many, many, many years ago, I, I went through sort of a process that going into it I thought was going to be stupid because, you know. But in the middle of that, in the middle of that experience, the leader said, I want you to put whatever it is that's keeping you from experiencing God's presence in your life in grace and blessing. I want you to put whatever that is in a suitcase. And then, and then she led us on a, on a trip in our mind, in our heart, where we were each carrying our suitcase. And, and, and we were able to imagine that suitcase being anything we wanted it to be. Maybe a suitcase we, we had had in our lives or we still have, or maybe it was a suitcase we dreamed about having. But we were each carrying our suitcases and we were walking down this path deep into a jungle. And she said, it's hot and it's humid and, and the suitcase is just too heavy for you to carry any further. I want you to put it down. Just put it down because we still have a ways to go before nightfall. And as we were walking away from that suitcase, she goes, now what I want you to know is that in a jungle, nothing survives the way it's left. That part of the growth of the jungle is to, is, to, is to consume and assimilate everything that is left on the floor. So whatever it is you left in that suitcase will very soon be overtaken by the growth of the jungle. And there's no way you can return or anyone will ever be able to return to pick it back up. That made such an impression on me clearly, right? Because I remember it like it was yesterday. Maybe you can do that. Or, or maybe you need to do it more physically. Maybe you take a sheet of paper and you write down what you need to let go. And maybe with supervision, if you need it, you, you take that piece of paper and you put it in your charcoal grill. Or you put it in your fire pit and you safely light it and let it be consumed into ash. Or maybe if it's just a single paper, not a whole pad, if it's a single paper... You tie it to a rock and you take it out to Lake Shawnee or Lake Lenexa or Kill Creek Park Lake. And you heave that rock out into the middle. Paper paper biodegrades. Somehow let yourself know that God wants to give you the courage to let go of whatever that is. So that God can fill you with life with those things that are life-giving, with those things that are filled with growth and possibility. And it won't be easy, and it will be different. But it will be a gift that you probably can't even right now imagine. I need to do it as well. Because it's a never-ending process. Rachel Held Evans reminds us in that quote that I gave to us at the beginning, God's deliverance isn't a one-time act. The God who delivers continues to walk with us on the journey through the wilderness so that each of us reaches finally the promised land. So may it be. Amen. i
sanctuary where you are it means a safe place and those people who surround you who love you are those that make it safe so I'll invite you to turn and share with one another signs of love and appreciation as we prepare to sing our last hymn together this morning Oh uh-huh. 
This indeed has been a special Sunday. Anytime we give the living word of God as a gift to our third graders, it reminds us that our foundations go deep in God's word. Stories like the one about Moses and the people of God uh, being liberated um, run throughout the scriptures. And third graders, I hope you get to know your Bible so that it becomes a friend. And I hope that's true for all of us, that that living word indeed gives us life reminds us of the promise we have of eternity and, and helps us to know that as we live in grace and hope, the world becomes closer to God's vision. Go in grace and go in peace. Amen. Amen.